Welcome to Epicenter, the show which talks about the technologies, projects, and people driving decentralization and the blockchain revolution. I'm Brian Crane, and I'm here with Frederike Ernst. Today, we're going to speak with Adrian Brink and Chris Goes. They're the co-founders, the two of the co-founders of Anoma. Anoma is, you know, a new proof of stake network or proof of stake network or networks, or there's lots and lots of innovations that they've done on like many different dimensions. Uh, and we look forward to diving into that with them. And yeah, before we get into that, briefly a few words about our sponsors. So first of all, we have Tally Ho. So Tally Ho is redefining the wallet as a public good. So it's a bit like a community owned alternative to MetaMask. So you can enter the metaverse with this wallet that's fully community owned. And it's also kind of DAO governed. Um, they became also the first sponsor of Ether rs.js an open source javascript library helping developers connect ethereum and they are committing 2.5 percent of their token supply to some gitcoin grant so yeah go check it out at tally.cash and then second of all we have cowswap so cowswap of course uh, is a project that comes out of gnosis and cowswaps basically aims to address some of the problem with DEXs. So DEXs are uh, vulnerable to things like front running, MEV, failed transaction, high gas costs, and uh, CowSwap offers a new kind of trading experience. So it's basically kind of a DEX aggregator aggregator. It finds overlapping orders and cow stands for queens in the wands, actually something that's also kind of uh, discussed in the Noma white paper. And so, you know, it kind of gets you the best price. And they also just did the airdrop. So, and the first cow swap improvement protocols are gone, uh, are going through. So it's kind of like fully live with also the cow token, the cow that's trading and swappable. So, and you know, LP program and all that kind of stuff. So go to cowswap.exchange and you can start there. So with that, let's go to our episode. So it's really great to have on, you know, Chris and Adrian. I've known uh, both. Of, I've known Adrian for for a long time. So this was like in, I guess, uh, early two thousand seventeen, summer two thousand seventeen. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, when I was working at Cosmos uh, or at Tendermint, and then Adrian joined uh, soon after, and it was, uh, and then of course Chris uh, also kind of, I guess Chris sort of joined Tendermint, I think when I was sort of leaving to start course, but still, you know, still working in the Cosmos ecosystem. And then of course, Chris came and did a lot of work on uh, IBC and, uh, you know, a bunch of other stuff. So, uh, yeah, it, but then of course they also started, I guess in parallel, they started a validator company called Cryptium that then of course one, we kind of took over as they discontinued that and to, to focus on Anoma, which is uh, you know an ambitious and large sort of attempt at reinventing a proof of stake network. So super excited to have you both on. Thanks so much for joining us. Glad to be here. Boy, when you say it like this, Anoma and Chorus One sound like some kind of complicated family history. Right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there's some some enmeshment going on, but. Um, <laughs> Maybe we can spend like, I don't know where we should start. I think like history and backgrounds is maybe going a bit too far. I mean, maybe we can just start with like Anoma. Like what, what was, what was sort of the impetus that you both decided, okay, you want to, you know, start your own proof of stake blockchain. Yeah, I, I guess I can quickly take this. Um, maybe to like quickly give you like a one sentence explanation of what Anoma is, right? Because it's not just yet another proof of stake chain. Um, really high level, you can think of Anoma as a suite of protocols for privacy preserving human coordination with as much information density as possible. Um, we can dive more into this, what this means specifically um, throughout this episode, but this is sort of as a um, initial statement. Um, yeah, the idea for Anoma actually came out of I think it was like middle of 2020 um, when our Chris and I sat down, I think in Berlin, like, you know, we had a lot of these smart contract platforms and it really wasn't clear 
I think to me, it's still not super clear what we should be using all these um, platforms for, because practically speaking, we have like 15 smart contracts written by 200 people. Um, and we all claim that thousands of smart contracts written by tens of thousands of developers. But practically speaking, right, the set is very small and we didn't want to build yet another smart contract platform. Um, and to us, what seemed important is to one, be privacy preserving. So provide universal privacy to any asset really, um, and to provide as much as, uh, privacy as possible when users interact with these systems. Uh, and when users also discover counterparties, so when they coordinate with other people using the same platform, um, and also to allow end users to really um, sort of uh, focus more on human coordination, where uh, when you sort of, how do you discover counterparties with whom you can settle? How do you have thousands of users sort of join to a single transaction? Because you can have these scenarios where I have BDC, you have ETH, and someone else is ETH, and DOT, and the third person is DOT, and um, ETH, I guess I started with. Um, and so how do you, if you have a non-overlapping set uh, of desires or intents, how do you settle this and how can you have thousands of parties, so you have thousands of unique intents that are individually unsettable, but that you can settle together on chain. Um, really, like the end goal is to bring as much information to into these human exchanges as possible, right? When you think of something like an election or even of like a purchase. It's a very information reductive system where you have a sort of single binary point where it's like you have an election, it's a binary choice vote. You have a, uh, you buy coffee, you have a purchase price that you're buying this coffee at. None of these systems are very information dense. And with blockchains, we can make all of these interactions a lot more information dense so that we can have automatic decentralized compute that sort of enforces my preferences on how I want to interact with the world so that every time I buy coffee, I get carbon neutral coffee in either this coffee is actually carbon neutral down the supply chain or I buy at the same time CO2 certificates to offset the cost of carbon off my coffee. For me, part of the thesis for Noma came from some of my past experience. I worked on a decentralized exchange protocol on Ethereum called Wyvern, which uh, uh, somewhat surprisingly ended up being very popular as it was used by OpenSea. But even at the time which I wrote it, I thought that that kind of protocol really needed a full stack architecture in order to work well. I think this is manifest in, for example, that OpenSea is kind of this uh, you know, somewhat central point in the Ethereum ecosystem because the liquidity is held on a database. Uh, the only thing that's decentralized to settlement and part of Enoma's design is to really approach that problem of exchange from a full stack design perspective, which means you can decentralize when appropriate, many more things, and you can kind of solve the problem uh, looking at what does the digital system itself need to do in mediating physical exchanges in a physical world through abstractions, which make sense and which correspond in the right ways. Um, and I think approaching that as a full stack design problem is really necessary. So Anoma's tagline is undefining money, right? So how does that fit into um, this idea of kind of abstracting certain things away? Uh, I, th I would say that it fits in and that the problem is that money abstracts too many things away. Uh, uh, it, it's odd that somehow blockchains have ended up creating a lot of diff more different kinds of money. Uh, which, uh, you know, perhaps that's helpful. Perhaps there are many different things we want to be representing and we should represent them with different assets. But uh, I would make the case, at least to some extent, that the problem is money itself. That often, let's say we have some kind of complex supply chain. So when you're making purchase decisions, your decisions have causal ramifications all up and down the supply chain. If you choose to buy a certain kind of coffee, your decisions, not individually, but in aggregate, uh, are used by producers to determine what they produce. Yet when you make that decision, you're making the decision only on the basis of what information is immediately available to you, which is usually just price. Maybe there's a fair trade label on one of the coffee bags. Maybe there are two fair trade labels, but there's not a lot of information about all of these different production practices which are going on. Many of these companies or other you know, entities along the supply chain who are involved in uh, producing the choices which you see in front of you are competing with each other. Uh, both on the basis of 
producing cheaper coffee and on the basis of producing propaganda, which is more effective in convincing you to buy the thing. Uh, so when you're making decisions based solely on price, then companies which can sacrifice some other value which you might have, such as, say, uh, impact on the environment, companies which can produce coffee which is slightly cheaper, say, or even producing a coffee bag which is cheaper by deforesting the Amazon or emitting some pollution into the Seine, uh, will win in a competitive market because that externality is not being captured by the system, even though it is, in some sense, uh, at least it seems, valued by the users of that system. So uh, to me, this is a, a failure in mechanism design. And in order to better incorporate the preferences of the people involved in these large complex economic systems, uh, we have two choices. One option is a reduction in complexity. So we could go back and live in tribes. Uh, and absent some other solution, I think that's kind of the default. Uh, but there are some nice things about complex society. Maybe it's worth saving. And if we want to save it, I think we need mechanisms for coordination which are better at capturing the, at the very least, the sort of first parts of the power law of impacts. So we can't measure everything about the causal ramifications of purchasing coffee, right? It's just immediately computationally infeasible. But maybe we can measure some of the most important things if we have a kind of system that allows us to internalize and compute over it. Uh, so by contrast, let's suppose that you wanted to exhaustively research the impacts of all of your choices on the uh, economy. You would need to, whenever you make a purchasing decision, research all of the suppliers, all of the choices they made, the production practices they're using, which go into that thing. And you need to perform some kind of causal calculus to determine like, okay, what is the sort of individual impact of your choice on this complex system? Because many of the choices have relations which are nonlinear, right? The company buys stuff in block. Uh, in order to do that, you probably need to spend like five years of your life. Once I read a thesis, master's thesis, I think, by some uh, three students at UCSD who went through the supply chain for a pair of common sneakers like running shoes. And it took them three years and they managed to trace 50%, about half of the organizations involved in that supply chain and what their production practices were like. So. Uh, we need a fancy spreadsheet that's very good at doing calculations and that's tamper resistant. And that seems to be the thing which blockchains are good at providing. Okay, so um, I, I kind of, I, I totally hear a lot of these problems. So I totally agree that there's a lot of externalities that are not priced into things um, and that basic information is difficult um, to obtain when you make consumer choices I, at 100%. Um, but why kind of attack this from the side of the money? Why can't you just have, say, an attestation server that kind of, um, for instance, tells me that the sweater I'm buying was uh, was made by people who were paid a livable wage and um, the cotton was farmed in a sustainable way and so on? So to be clear, I think you also need that. Blockchains don't verify data about the external world. Uh, there's nothing, you know, there's nothing the blockchain could do except serve as a kind of sensor tamper resistant ledger for maybe some kinds of uh, multi-party oracle system, which is like, I guess, the attestation server you're talking about. A blockchain can be used as a record, uh, which has some nice properties you might want for a record, but it can't measure the actual data. Humans or human organizations have to do that. What I think the blockchain can do is make it uh, uh, provide a canonical. So in some sense, the benefit uh, blockchain brings here is centralization, not decentralization. It's one spreadsheet. And if you have one spreadsheet that measures production practices, then you can incorporate this into an economic system. So instead of every company or every individual needing to independently audit their supply chains, this is what happens at the moment. Only the really, really large corporations can do this because it requires a lot of time. Uh, but uh, really large corporations can go through and audit their supply chains, and sometimes they have to do so for legal compliance reasons. But right now, mostly this happens by them independently auditing their supply chains because there's no way to track the data at the time the practice of production actually occurs. Uh, so it seems, at least plausibly, that if it were possible to track the data when the practice of production occurs and track it in a way that is also compatible for the companies involved, namely it has to be private, people don't want to reveal all of what they're doing all of the time, then having a, a logically centralized, operationally decentralized ledger um, might provide a way to compute over this data. So you could reason about impacts. So so just to kind of to recap this, so I mean, obviously, this is a multidimensional um, 
uh, problem, right? So basically, obviously, the factors that kind of the production factors that go into producing whatever um, can be measured along several dimensions. So for instance, maybe I maybe I care about river pollution. Maybe I care, maybe I care about um, uh, some sort of mi minimum wage. Maybe I care about um, not having something produced by children um, or having something not flown around the world, but, you know, did, uh, actually uh, brought on a container ship or even produced locally and so on. So basically, your idea would be that the sweater I would buy, basically, that would actually come with a register of properties. So for instance, um, locally Hansoon and Brandenburg or um, uh, died only with organic dyes or made without the contributions of slaves or children or whatever. And then basically I could kind of, um, I could choose um, w which ones of the blocks that are not checked to, con uh, to, to offset um, uh, manually. Uh, is that kind of the idea? Kind of, but also that you could negotiate by making a commitment. So you could say that you're not going to, it would probably be on the basis of exclusion, like externalities you don't want, since those are fewer to list. Uh, and you could maybe make a commitment to say, I'm just not going to buy products which contribute to, say, environmental pollution in such and such a fashion and such and such a magnitude. And if a bunch of people make those commitments together, corporations or producers can see this and it changes their incentives for what to produce in the first place. Okay, but then basically this entire thing turns into an oracle problem, right? So how 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 do I how do I prove that the sweater is uh, river pollution free? Uh, I I don't think I mean blockchains can serve as a like good ledger and they can serve as a point of settlement for some kind of shelling point game or multiple people report and they're censorship resistant, which is helpful. I think you still need human organizations to solve the oracle problem, uh, but. Part of that is a computation over the economic transactions which are happening, and I think blockchains can be helpful there. Maybe an important point to also note here is that uh, this is a so an example application, right? This isn't necessarily something that is short-term feasible. I think this is something that sort of becomes feasible over the next 10 years as more and more data becomes available on decentralized systems. Um, it is more general. Uh, I, I think the important point is that a nomad doesn't actually know what a carbon price is or what an asset is or what a trade is or even what sort of a settlement price is. It is just a, we've built and designed a nomad around the premise that people can bring whatever assets they want and can do incredibly flexible uh, compute over those assets that is can be both transparent as well as private. One thing I'm curious about, uh, I, I remember if I read that or heard it somewhere mentioned, but that you know, a NOMA doesn't, uh, you know, there's no asset issuance on NOMA itself, but only these, uh, you know, the kind of transaction. So in the end, is, is it fair to kind of characterize a NOMA as, you know, a sort of an attempt at creating a very generalized marketplace? I wouldn't say marketplace necessarily. Maybe let me start with asset issuance. So you can theoretically issue assets on a NOMA. There's nothing preventing people from doing this. Um, you have similar facilities to what, in terms of user programmability, that would allow you to build these kind of, recalling the validity predicates that allow you to build asset issuance programs. Uh, I think our fundamental thesis with our, with our NOMA though is that there are tons of places that issue assets already. And nine months ago, the world became interoperable with Chris publishing IBC. Um, okay, this was kind of, uh, but yeah. Uh, so now this is interoperable and we can just uh, leverage a lot of these assets that exist in the ecosystem to flow in and out of Anoma. And so Anoma is just there to um, not provide asset issuance, but rather to provide really good base layer functionality for assets that already exist. Um, for example, Another thing that Anoma has that no one else has at this point in time is an intent, incentivized intent gospel matchmaking system. So it, like when you think about discovering counterparties, right, on sort of what happens in Uniswap or uh, on Ethereum of Moses actually, is that you have uh, the contract being the central counterparty, as in I always interact with the contract and the contract is sort of the shelling point where everyone 
goes to discover the counterparties. What you can do with Onoma is you can instead have uh, issue an intent, which is cryptographically signed. Um, and then you can have sort of 100 million intents floating around in this large soup. And there's an economic incentive for people to look at all these intents and see if they're combinable. Um, as in, you can sort of, someone can look at the soup of 100 million intents and go, oh, these 15, if I can combine them and settle them on chain or submit them as a transaction on chain, uh, they will satisfy each one of the criteria. And they don't have to be direct matches. This is sort of the important point because intents are just programmable. Like it's just code. It's not a price. It's not a specific asset. This is not what an intent understands. An intent is just uh, at runtime interpretable code that says whether it's okay with some future state outcome. Uh, so you can have like one intent that says, I'm happy to have one Bitcoin less if I have 10 more ETH and the weather in Berlin is nice. And then you can have 14 other intents that sort of combine into this. And when you submit them on chain, all the validity pad, all these intents return true to whether they are happy with the uh, resulting state outcome. Uh, this is something that you can't build on any existing system and it removes the need to have these uh, very centralized counterparty discovery points like a Uniswap AMM contract, um, which is cool. It doesn't exist at this point. And you combine this with a bunch of front running tech to make this um, yeah, front running resistant and censorship resistant. So maybe it would make sense because I think it's probably not so easy for people like listening to kind of like wrap their head around like what exactly is going on. So I wonder if you can speak about, I don't know, like a few use cases, like, you know, like where you think like, okay, that's sort of the thing that, you know, it's going to work best and, you know, kind of like run through, you know, what that looks like and maybe the different stakeholders in those, in those examples. Yeah, actually we, I guess we can start with Amada. Um, so this is sort of, there's no Twitter account yet for this, but we are probably launching a blockchain later this year called Namada um, to just sort of, this has, which has taken about 20% of mainnet Anoma and gone, you know, this works right now. We can put this onto its own chain and launches as the first chain in the Anoma ecosystem. Um, so, and you can sort of th see this as the first use case. So what Namada does is just provide multi-asset privacy, right? To just provide asset agnostic privacy guarantees where there is a single shill pool in which all assets can live. So an end user could move and like CryptoPunk from Ethereum over the bridge into Nomada, move it into the shield pool there and you gain, and now this CryptoPunk lives on the same privacy set as all the USDC, all the DAI, all the Atoms, all the Osmo, all the NAM. Um, and it's indistinguishable from each other, uh, from each other, from all the other assets when you interact with us. And so this is a use case, this will work in about- So, so the use case, so the example would be like, I have a CryptoPunk, you know, I want to sell my CryptoPunk for something, right? This doesn't involve trading yet. This is just privacy. Wait, so why do I, why do I want to use, so if, if I, as so I have my CryptoPunk on Ethereum, so why do I want to move it over there? Um, because you want privacy for your CryptoPunk. Um, this also works for sort of simple payments. You want to you do mean simple- You if I want to like, if I want to like move the CryptoPunk to a different e Ethereum address, but I, I don't want people to be able to link the two addresses, for example. For example, yeah. Uh, to be fair, the NFT thing, I should probably not start on this. NFTs are much harder in this regard. Uh, this is way easier to understand with fungible tokens. Uh, think of this as you want to have cheap uh, multi-asset privacy for your USDC or your atoms. Uh, you can move them into Nomada, move them into your shield pool, move them around, hold them into the shield pool because We've come up with a very interesting new circuit design that allows you allows Namada to incentivize uh, assets that are being held in the shield pool. Um, because honestly, this is like a shield pool is a public good that we should be sort of incentivizing people to use. But while they're in the shield pool, they, they, do they do anything? I mean, let's say, okay, so let's say that we don't want a punk example, because I guess you can see the punk still afterwards. But so let's say the example of like, I don't know, UST, right? I have a bunch of UST. Uh, so I, I'm going to move the UST into this shielded pool and, and I, I guess one use case would be, I want to like take it out, put it into a different address, right? I want, or like, you know, I want to send somebody some UST. I don't want them to see all my wallet, right? Which is actually, I guess, a pretty common problem today, right? And probably the best solution, ironically, problem. is like the centralized exchange, right? Where you actually, oh, I'm going to send it from like Binance, right? Because, okay, Binance knows, but at least like not everybody knows. 
So I can see that example. Is, is that is that kind of the example you're talking about? Yes, this is um, sort of a very simple use case, which is just multi-asset privacy, um, both in order to make your assets private, not because you want to send them to other people, but because you want to make your own holdings private that have already been publi uh, publicized, or you want to send, pay your contract on USDT. Um, and yes, currently we're all using exchanges as mixers effectively. We're all going like, oh yeah, everyone gets a unique address and I withdraw from Kraken to my unique addresses and then I pay people from those. Um, it's not a good model. Like no one can tell me this. Um, and why, so your question was also, why should assets within the shill pool actually um, and sort of inflationary rewards. In the shill pool, um, the assets in the shill pool contribute to the overall privacy set. Um, so in the same sense that assets in a liquidity pool contribute to the overall liquidity, assets in a shill pool contribute to the overall privacy set. So, um, and this is something you don't want to have many different privacy sets over time. Ideally, you have one really large one that everyone uses. Um, and this is why we have this incentive design um, to allow people to hold assets in the shield pool and earn rewards on them. So, but let's say like in the UST example, just to stay on that. So I, I mean, right, like, like, let's say I, today, maybe I'm providing liquidity on osmosis also, right? And, and, uh, is it something that like, will it be possible to kind of, you know, provide liquidity on, on something like osmosis, for example? Uh, while having it in the shield pool? I don't think so, no. Uh, so it's like, um, these should be binary choices as in um, it's sort of the same, similar with staking, right? Um, except that with private pools and generally zero knowledge proofs, this gets way harder than everyone thinks. Uh, so you generally have to like pick which thing you move your asset into. I have several technical questions. Can I ask them? So my first question, technical question is um, multi-asset shielded pools. Why don't we see them more often? Because I mean, if you if you look at like uh, things like Zcash on, and Tornado and so on, they're always single asset. Good question. You know, we actually built the multi-asset shielded pool a year ago and we released it as open source and no one has launched it yet. Um, so yeah, I'm not quite sure. I, maybe because Ethereum gas fees are very high, maybe because IBC until recently wasn't uh, particularly popular, so there haven't been many interconnected assets uh, on a low-cost transfer protocol. I, I think multi-asset shielded pools are pretty obvious. Yeah, um, single asset shield pools don't make that much sense unless you, I mean, like Zcash has this problem, right? That like. Uh, the value of Zach is sort of being tied to having access to the Shiloh pool. Um, and I think that, especially in the Zcash community, there were concerns of, well, if you allow other assets into that Shiloh pool, why would anyone use Zach? Because this was sort of the monetary play on the asset. Um, and on Ethereum, I mean, I, if you've tried all these solutions, they are like horrendously expensive. The Tornado Cash is something like $300 to, use a, to do a single transaction with it. Um, and maybe also the other big thing, which... For some reason, most people haven't done, which I think is because circuit design is very, very hard and way harder than the general public expects, is that you can move assets within the shield pool, right? Like Tornado Cash allows you to sort of deposit uh, fixed denominations of assets and withdraw them. It's not actually that there's a shield pool for ETH in Tornado Cash. There's a shield pool for 0.1 ETH and 1 ETH and 10 ETH and 100 ETH. There's actually like four shield pools for ETH in Tornado Cash. Um, and you uh, cannot this, move this them within. This has changed since so basically oh, now nice. you can you can actually you can actually deposit arbitrary amounts and the fees have also gone way down because it's now a gnosis chain <laughs> try it try it out it's awesome all right i'll try it um, on gnosis. <laughs> <laughs> fantastic so my second question um is um is this utxo or account based because basically it sounded like in principle it was account based, but how do you do this with an account? The short answer is that it's both. So uh, in uh, the private bartering, so in, in the, the MASP is UTXO based, uh, as in order to get privacy for uh, using zero knowledge proofs for some kind of system, uh, privacy using zero knowledge proofs is always achieved by having the parties 
to whom you want the data to be private, hold the data and make the proofs, which means that you need to have, like as opposed to public accounts, you need to have the uh, accounts themselves be private and be like known only by the users. Uh, it's possible in principle to architect an account system using ZKPs, but it requires a different kind of private Merkle tree lookup, which is very tricky. So uh, the MSP uses UTXOs and the more generalized circuit that we're def uh, working on called Taiga for private bartering also has notes, but it has programmable validity predicates attached to the notes. So uh, both assets and users uh, have additional circuits defined as recursive circuits in the Taiga circuit, which must pass in order for the transaction to validate. And these are used for intents and for assets, for example. An asset validity predicate circuit could contain logic around when it's possible to mint or burn assets uh, or who is allowed to transfer assets even, although that's checked in private. Uh, and a user validity predicate could contain information about what keys are needed to authorize a transfer for different amounts or how much the user account is allowed to send in a day. And an intent validity predicate could cover like anyone can uh, redeem this note and spend it themselves if they spend me a note of a different crypto kitty, something like that. So the barter which the user wishes to perform. And specifically sort of on the account versus UTXO um, distinction, uh, so the multi-asset tool pool is just another account, on, both on Namada as well as on Noma. So it is deployed as a validity predicate, where the validity predicate just verifies the proofs against the masked circuit. Um, so Namada and Noma are both uh, account-based systems to which you can deploy circuits like the MASP. Um, and on Namada, it just happens that the MASP is one of the first circuits that we're deploying. Okay, I have a lot of questions. Um, may maybe I leave most of them out right now. But um, so may maybe I mean you you kind of you keep distinguishing between Anoma and Namada. So basically, Anoma is the ledger, and um, Namada is the blockchain. This is another distinction. No, this is not correct. Okay, I see you. I see, I see you shaking your head. So please please set me right here. Uh, both are blockchains. It just happens that Namada is a uh, sort of, uh, it's called a specific subset of features that we initially we wanted to also put into mainnet Anoma, but we sort of went, you know, this is ready way earlier. Let's just put this onto its own chain and launch it um, and see what people think because we can provide multi asset it's privacy. It's like the al alcoholic and, uncle of Anoma. Yeah, I wouldn't put it that way, but um, <laughs> I, I the guess. Alcoholic uncle who's too drunk to remember what you transferred, so that's why it's private. <laughs> <laughs> I guess. No, but so both are just blockchains um, and just uh, Nomada happens to be ready earlier and we can launch this this year to provide multi-asset privacy to people, whereas the entire private bartering interface or private bartering applications with main or Noma would are still going to take until probably early 2023. And, and then like later on, so let's say we have this Anoma and then we have this Amada, uh, are, are these like independent blockchains that, you know, they're just going to like interact with IBC, they have their own staking token, their own validator set, or, or like what is going to be the relationship between these two blockchains? They are fractal instances. So Anoma has a different, uh, you could call it a scaling architecture, which separates two concerns of architectural homogeneity and security model homogeneity. So if you think about uh, if, if we look at sort of blockchain scaling architectures writ large, you can kind of classify them in two dimensions. There's architecture, like what is the what is the VM system like for Ethereum? It's the EVM for something like Near as WebAssembly. What how are, how do key formats work? How do applications interface with the protocol? Um, that's one dimension. The other dimension is security model, both in theory, like what's the proof of stake system? Is it proof of stake at all versus proof of work? Who's operating, and also in practice, who's operating it? What are the concrete like validators and voting powers, right? And generally those two dimensions have been designed in parallel. So like Ethereum has a, if you want to deploy to Ethereum, you use the Ethereum architecture and you accept the Ethereum security model. There's a like one major instance that supports that architecture, and then now some other chains which also support the EVM. Uh, and if you want to deploy to Polkadot, there's sort of a Polkadot architecture, a Polkadot security model. If you look at the, like, 
If you look at all of the blockchains, which talk via interoperability protocols like IBC or Bridges, those have heterogeneous architecture and, heter and a heterogeneous security model. So uh, you have different security models based on which chain you're interacting with, um, and you have different architectures. The idea of fractal instances is to have a, you know, these are, of course, broad generalizations, but a more homogeneous architecture while uh, having a heterogeneous security model with the idea that there might be a sort of, there's a lot of benefit to standardizing architecture. It's a kind of benevolent monopoly. Everyone can use applications which work with the same technical stack and the same zero knowledge circuits, stuff like this, while security models are something that might you might want to vary more based on application, based on what you're actually trying to do with the blockchain, what's the real world value attached, and who do you trust to handle your assets or you know, settle your transactions for you. That, that that sounds basically like the the cosmos model though no where you have like cosmos sdk which is, you know i mean maybe there's some modification that chains do but you know a lot of the fundamental thing is the same but then you know they have their own validator sets so uh, how, how does it differ from that i think they can all be an interoperable happy family it's not not designed as a as a competitor of cosmos but um i would distinguish maybe which parts of the stack are standardized so uh, we're not intent that there's no like state machine framework as part of the Anoma architecture the whole um, application stack is standardized so you know people can pick and choose different components if they want but um, when you write an application on the Anoma architecture you're writing an application which has a part uh, you know, uh, logic defined for intent gossip and matchmaking and logic defined for settlement. That application could run on, you know, any Anoma fractal instance. So it could run on the fractal instance in Berlin or the fractal instance for Europe or the fractal instance run in your backyard between four friends, or it could run on the global instance. Different fractal instances over time will, I mean, Nomada doesn't start supporting the whole Anoma architecture. Um, and maybe it will remain just focused on shielded transfers, which is nice because it can provide quality of service guarantees that are more difficult to provide if it targets a more general use case. Uh, but the idea is, uh, for example, that you could have assets in a wallet on your phone, and as you go around traveling, those assets can automatically roam, almost like cell phone roaming, subject to some of your preferences for safety, to different Anoma instances as you need to settle bartering. This is Does arguably have... also... Um, how humans scale, right? Um, I, I think one thing we keep forgetting is that, so with all the sharding solutions, we have single security models, which are single points of failure. Uh, to some extent, we probably shouldn't design a world financial system that has single points of failures, even if those single points of failures are decentralized in themselves. Um, what we ideally want is financial systems which are interoperable, decoupled, as in, like the financial system in Europe should be able to fail independently of the financial system in the US. Um, and you want to, as a user, be able to take your assets from between those financial systems. Um, and then if your assets happen to be in the US while the US financial system fails, then that's a problem. But if your assets are within Europe while the US financial system fails, then you're fine. Um, this is how we've built very resilient civilizations over time. And for some reason, we keep throwing out this idea um, when we start designing blockchains at this point in time. Does this mean that um, the Anoma ecosystem is stateless? I would say that the point of uh, sticky standardization, the thing that's hard to change is the protocol. It's does it, We're trying to design it so that it's easy to change the instance. So that if you just decide that you don't like your validators anymore, you can fire them and go somewhere else. And you can fire them without necessarily coordinating with everyone else who uses the same instance because the protocol is interoperable. So if you want to, the cost of secession is low. So if you want to, you know, take a few of your friends and start using another instance, but retain your ability to transact with the quote unquote main economy, you can do that. The thing which is sticky and the thing which we think it's beneficial to standardize correspondingly is this architecture. So uh, what the circuits are, how the protocol works, how even to the level of like how applications communicate with it. Sure. Uh, so that if you really want to, you know, if the validators go berserk and you really need to change your economy, you can like take a state dump and spin up a new instance uh, and that will just work. But then so still like the these different chains then 
would have their own validator set, their own staking token, and uh, that's still the case. And that's kind of a proof of stake system similar to something like Cosmos or? They don't have to be proof of stake. Um, Anoma uses obviously, so uh, perhaps a modified version, but uh, chains can be proof of stake, they can be proof of authority, they can be proof of work with some kind of uh, finality gadget, they can be uh, proof of some other kind of identity even. Okay, okay. But yes, Namada and Anoma are both proof of stake uh, with separate tokens. Um, Sort of on the token model, it, I think the closest what in existence so far is probably Kusama and Polkadot. Um, I'll bite. Uh, it's an imperfect comparison. Um, but yes, they're separate tokens, separate chains, um, separate security models. Namada also has a, has an inbuilt governance module, right? Or facilities. Or, I mean, you can vote and, and, uh, and signal, right? Yep, that's right. How does that work, and uh, basically, what kind of powers does it give to uh, the token holders? It's quite simple. The Nevada governance module acts as just a credible proof of stake voting power backed signaling. So anyone can create a text proposal, and people can vote on that, and everyone can see that a certain amount of stake, such as two thirds, is backed a particular written text proposal. Nomada governance proposals can also execute code. Nomada supports WebAssembly, just not complete user programmability yet. So the governance system can execute code and change parameters or deploy different validity predicates. Maybe it's important to point out here as well that there are very few functionalities built into the protocols. As in the protocol is really just a way to have interpretation at runtime. Uh, so for example, proof of stake, is just another validity predicate, predicate in the system, the same way that multi-asset shield pool is just another validity predicate in the system. The same applies to governance as well as to IBC. So most functionalities are really just built as validity predicates um, at the same level as user deployed um, code. Cool, maybe let's, let's uh, zoom out. So uh, Namada is the part of uh, the protocol family that's live now. Um, let's talk about Anoma and what it will add to that. Sure. Uh, just to clarify, Nomada, unfortunately, is not live now. Hopefully, it will be live uh, later testnet, this year. No? There is a testnet. OK, sorry. We're using, we're using GIS. Yes. Nomada is live. Nomada, I, I'll take it. I'll take it and run with it. <laughs> Nomada is live. There's a testnet, um, which you could find information about on the GitHub. And there will be more testnets with more features coming soon. Uh, what does Anoma add to that? Well, the other 80%. Uh, so uh, Nomada already has proof of stake. It already has multi-asset shield transfers. It already has a governance system, but it doesn't have programmatic private bartering. It doesn't have um, the consensus system called Typhon that we're building. Um, and it doesn't have the intent gossip and matchmaking layer. It does also doesn't have Fervio yet um, for front running protection. Y yes, please absolutely give an example because I think we could all use one. Sure thing. Um, so the example I like to use of private bartering, um, because I think it's grounded in a kind of physical scarcity, which is likely to remain a problem that people want bartering systems to solve for a long time, is an example of going to a concert. So let's say that I want to take a train with my friend to a concert in another city in Germany, uh, some kind of uh, nice festival in the summer where they play lots of tech and music and featuring uh, uh, interesting artists. I want to get cheap tickets to the concert. I want to go with my friend. I need to train in a hotel to be, and tickets to be synchronized, but I want them to be as cheap as possible and I want to buy on the secondary market. So I need to buy along with, I don't care you know, which specific weekend this um, ticket is for the festival, as long as it's like one of these four weekends and I can go with my friend. So using Anoma, I could create an intent in the private bartering system, which expresses these combination of constraints that along with my friend and we're going to split the payment, I want to buy two tickets to this festival, two train tickets and two hotel rooms. They need to be synchronized. They need to be for the same weekend dates. If I have a train for one weekend and a hotel for another weekend and concert tickets for a third weekend, it's not very useful. Uh, but otherwise, I'm you know fine with any of the weekends and I want to get the cheapest price possible. You can use the Enoma Intent Gossip and Matchmaking system 
uh, along with settlement, to both discover counterparties, so to, to find people, and they could be different people who are selling hotel tickets, train tickets, and concert tickets, uh, and to settle with them, to pay them the money. Maybe there are many counterparties. Um, uh, and settle that transaction privately on the ledger atomically so that you're ensured that you and your friend both get tickets, you can go with each other, and you're going on the same weekend, whatever weekend that is. I, I understand the problem. Uh, I'm uh, intimately familiar with the problem, not because I go to, not because I go to um, lots of events and book hotels, but because we, we built something similar named CowSwap. Um, so um, basically, if you want to find um, the the cheapest price for everyone or the fairest price for everyone, I can assure you this is an NP hard problem. So how do you solve that? Yeah, I mean, the other constraint we're operating under is privacy, as in we don't want users using the intent gossip system to reveal more than they have to about their identities. Yeah, so basically, you have you have you have five problems that we're trying to solve at the same time. <laughs> yeah. So the um, plan we've come up with this in the private intent gossip system so far is a sort of progressive price discovery where users broadcast intents that expire. So I start out offering and I start out with kind of a, uh, 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 the lowest price, a price that is probably not, no one is going to offer for uh, lowest price for these items, which I want atomically tickets uh, for hotels, um, train and the concert. And I can increase that price successively uh, as soon as my previous intent expires. So I start with an intent that's valid for 30 seconds, this price, then I can, as long as I'm willing to keep going up, keep increasing the price until I see it settled. That provides a kind of private price discovery and that you don't reveal um, the maximum price you're willing to pay immediately. And you also don't need to reveal your individual identity. You're just like revealing that you want programmatically these kinds of tickets and you're willing to pay in this asset. And maybe also the important thing to add here is that none of this happens necessarily on chain, right? This isn't that you're deploying, that you're sort of sending transactions with an increasing price. It is that you have intents of which you can have sort of, you can issue intents at half a second intervals. It doesn't matter. This is a uh, non, non cohesive global gossip network. So you can have 100 million intents and not all people need to have the same view of what intents are available. Um, but there are economic incentives for a role called a matchmaker to look at all these intents and go, which ones are combinable on chain? Uh, so you don't have the problem that you have to run all this compute on which ones are combinable on chain and in consensus. Um, rather, matchmakers pay fees. And of course, if they submit something that's actually not settleable, then they lose sort of, the fees they've paid um, but you aren't trying to settle every single combination on chain. Okay, so basically the matchmakers, they kind of, they try to fi find circles, right? So, but basically what, and then, and then they basically, they, they, they get a percentage of the fee, right? But um, are the intents, are they encrypted or are they uh, plain text? The what is plain text, but the who is encrypted. So, the who, okay. So basically, you, you, you would send, uh, I don't know, pink for 50 euros, pink for 55 euros, pink for 60 euros, and someone, we would know that someone wants to go to a pink concert, but we, didn't, we wouldn't know it's you. That's right. So as an addition here, um, intents don't know, like, they're not, because I think a lot of people, when they hear these kind of explanations, think, like, there's a sort of table you fill in as in like, I want to buy this asset, I want to sell that asset, and I want to sell it for that price. This is not what intents are. Intents are just effectively code um, that gets run, that gets executed at runtime when these get uh, settled on chain to say whether someone accepts it. So you can do arbitrary things, like you can do, say, I want to sell Bitcoin for ETH only if it's sunny in Berlin, and if I can also buy a flight to San Francisco, um, as in, the limitation is gas at this point. It's not what is expressible. So you can express anything here. So, so one, one question that comes to my mind on this. So, I mean, if, if the intent is basically, okay, it's not a transaction, but it's something that can be taken, you know, to like execute on chain. And I mean, let's say my private key is, I mean, I mean, in this example, right, I'm, I'm, in, okay, I'm increasing the concert ticket price, you know, 
I mean, how do I, how does that transaction signing work? I mean, let's say for example, my key is on a ledger. Do they then have to like go and sign like sixty transaction and accuse them and sense them like one by one or like? So Noma handles this by you can think of it as splitting the authorization logic into part that's in the intent and part that's on the ledger, and the part that's on the ledger acts as an outer bound. So it says something like, um, you know, don't allow this, don't allow more than a thousand euros a day to be spent by this particular account unless authorized by my ledger. But for anything under that, it's fine. Uh, to use this key, which is some you know MetaMask key or even something automated run by your wallet, um, to uh, authorize specific intents, and those that key would be used. The more ephemeral key would be used for signing successfully increasing prices in that case. And this also, of course, means that you only pay gas um, when something is actually matched and executed. Actually, the person paying the gas here would be the matchmaker. Um, right, so if you take fifteen different intents, the intents themselves aren't paying for gas, but the person that stuff says that these are settled on chain pays for the gas. Okay, and the person who matchmakes gets a percentage of whatever each person is giving, or do they have to pay? Do, do they have to pay the matchmaker? Yes, separately? that's in the validity predicate. No, that. So uh, Brian, Brian already knows the answer. <laughs> <laughs> it's just a guess. It, 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 it is in uh, it is in a validity predicate. I think it's worth one one thing I would note is that when we talk about the matchmaker here, the matchmaker is a role. It's not a designated entity like a validator. A matchmaker doesn't need a specific key. There's no you know anyone could be a matchmaker at any time, and by default, the Enoma node when you run it acts as a participant in the intent gossip node network and as a matchmaker. So hopefully there will be a pretty decentralized set of matchmakers to try and encourage such a decentralized set of intent gossip participants as matchmakers. We have designed uh, an incentive system for the intent gossip network, whereby when you broadcast intents to another node uh, who might be a matchmaker, you can choose a portion of the fee that you will get if those intents are settled. So when uh, and, and whatever fee there is remaining, uh, which is set by the person who initially creates it, will go to the matchmaker. So if I am sending some intents, many of the things being bartered aren't even fungible tokens anyways, so charging a percentage is not very straightforward. If I'm just buying concert tickets, you know, I can't give the matchmaker like a quarter of the concert ticket. Um, so to my intent, I would attach a little like, you know, if you facilitate this trade for me, and if I'm paying in dollars, it can be incorporated. But if you facilitate this trade for me, I'm willing to pay you a dollar, right? Then the next node in the intent gossip network can look at that and say, okay, can I settle this? And if he can settle it or she can settle it, uh, that node can directly claim the fee. But if they can't, uh, then we have this like incentive design question where if we don't give them any way to benefit from rebroadcasting that intent, they'll probably just keep it until they get an intent which they could sell. Why would they send it away to someone else for free? It's valuable data, it's liquidity. So in the Enoma architecture, when you when they send the intent onwards, they can basically add their signature to a signature chain uh, and say, I will take this part of the fee. And they can actually choose how much of the fee they will take. But if the next node doesn't like that, they'll probably just reject the intent so it won't eventually be settled. There's this multi-multi-round game going on between nodes to figure out what fees they should use on pieces of liquidity, where individual nodes, uh, which are acting rationally, will act to maximize their expected like fees times the likelihood that some piece of liquidity will be settled. So basically, you're trying to... Um uh, you're trying to disincentivize rent seeking by any individual, but the rent seeking of the protocol itself is not minimized, right? So basically, if I'm willing to pay a dollar for um, a trade to be settled, I will pay that dollar, even if it costs way less. That's right, although that can be progressively discovered by broadcasting intents with different fees. I mean, w w one thing that uh, it's maybe not so much a question as like an observation, and I'd be curious for your thoughts on that. Uh, but one thing that stood out to me, you know, was that in the white paper, you know, it talks about the, you know, P2P electronic cash system, you know, so of course, referencing 
you know, the Bitcoin white paper and sort of the, the original Bitcoin, you know, the sort of original thing that Bitcoin was, you know, kind of um, promoted for and envisioned for, right? Of course, over time, it kind of changed. It became more of this digital gold type uh, store of value asset. Well, you know, what's interesting is, I guess, normally it seems like that was thought of more in terms of, you know, the currency, like some sort of, you know, cryptocurrency or blocks, you know, but, you know, particular currency with maybe particular characteristics, you know, so of course you had like Bitcoin and then, uh, well, I guess let's say Cash was like, oh no, but it's important to have like privacy if you have that. And, and then here it's, I, I guess you're trying to solve the same problem in some way, but in like completely approaching it from a completely different angle, right? Not not looking at it in terms of a currency, but looking at it in terms of sort of, you know, how do people come to some kind of uh, agreement, right? On on some kind of transaction. Does, does that make sense? Or That's broadly true. I mean, this is also a little bit where the tagline undefining money comes from. It, it's really the idea that um, there are lots of currencies potentially, and there can be sort of hundreds of millions of different currencies. And every user can end up wanting to hold their own currency, right? Like if I only want to hold tokenized Beanie Babies, that's my prerogative. I can, um, and I should be allowed to. Um, but the big question is, so once everyone can hold their own currencies, for one, how do you uh, make those transactions private? So how do you build asset agnostic privacy preserving systems where you can use arbitrary currencies, where you can sort of do private transfers with tokenized Beanie Babies. Um, and the other question is, if ever, if we're starting to see this explosion in currencies, which I guess at the at this moment we see, um, how do you enable bartering between different currencies very effectively without requiring sort of centralized order books? Because one other way to look at the Anoma Intent system is as user-defined runtime order books, right? Like traditionally, when you look at centralized exchanges or at something like Uniswap and AMM, um, you have protocol-defined um, order books, right? There is like a USDC ETH pair, um, or there's an ETH Bitcoin pair. Uh, with Anoma, there isn't any pair because the protocol doesn't know what a pair is. Rather, a user writing an intent creates this own pair, which is settleable, not with the specific inverse to this, but with anything that can effectively eventually form a ring, whether this is one other party or a thousand other parties. So you can have someone that wants to trade, like I want to trade Bitcoin for Beanie Babies. Someone wants to trade Bit Beanie Babies for concert tickets and concert tickets for chickens and chickens for cows and cows for Bitcoin. Um, and as long as this exists, you can settle all of this. So you allow everyone to hold arbitrary different current, arbitrarily different currencies um, and still be able to interact with each other um, in the financial world privately using Anoma. Right. So that, that I, I can kind of, so that does seem like a nice thing, right? Because, okay, I'm going to the cafe, right? And I guess the cafe could be like, okay, I'm willing to sell like coffee for, you know, USDC, for example, right? And then I can be, and, and I'm going as the person buying coffee and I'm like, oh, I want to buy coffee and I'm happy to pay, you know, Bitcoin or, or something else that's kind of like connected to the normal system. And then it would be like, yeah, like, I don't know, Frederica running some sort of, you know, a trading business on the side that is like, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm always making a market between Bitcoin and USCC, right? And then it's kind of, that would get settled, right? So that, that transaction would happen. Yeah, I mean, and so, so that this does is, seem like, a, that does seem quite elegant to me. This is probably the single simplest example, right? Like what I wanted to also get out of this space when I joined. It's like, I want to be able to use my phone instead of my credit card to pay in San Francisco. Um, and if I use cash, I have all the privacy guarantees, but I have a lot of the inconveniences of I have to physically exchange Swiss francs for usd and then pay in the store and now i have excess usd that i don't know what to do with anymore um, and i can't do this digitally with a system like anoma i can tap my phone in san francisco to buy coffee the merchant can say well i only accept usdc i say well i only want to spend digitized swiss francs uh, the entire interaction can be fully private 
and I sort of get a mid-market rate, at the time when I tap my phone, um, so I spend my digitized first franc and the merchant receives his USDC. Um, and I think no one has built this for some reason, which I'm very surprised by, because honestly, this is arguably one of the most obvious use cases um, for decentralized tech. But yeah, the tech wasn't there like until nine months ago with interoperability and zero knowledge groups. So we're getting there now. But yeah, this is sort of a super simple example of what you can do with something like a normal. I mean, one other topic that comes to mind, uh, you know, when you, when you talk about this, I mean, maybe it's like go, going to a little bit in a different direction. Uh, you know, one, one thing we're seeing at the moment is, you know, this like seemingly pretty rapid attempts by uh, governments to sort of, you know, enforce this, uh, basically passing KYC information, right, with crypto transaction, right? I think in the Europe, they have this unhosted wallet thing. I saw the thing in Canada, right? It was a similar thing. It's probably going to happen in like US, I expect, you know, like many countries. Where do you think this is going in general? And then how how is that going to play in the kind of Anoma architecture and system? Yeah, so... I mean, okay, uh, I can start with the general answer. I think regulation, um, regulators are kind of screwed, um, not because they're bad at their job, but because they're too slow. Um, as in, I think the tech is evol evolving way faster than regulators can understand new tech, which means that sort of this gap between what they understand and what's currently happening is keeps widening. Uh, we saw a similar thing happening with the internet, if I'm honest, where the internet and everything built on top of it evolved way faster than regulators could understand how it works. So due to this, I'm actually fairly optimistic that it seems very unlikely that regulators will ever catch up to sort of the latest cutting edge. Uh, specifically on sort of this KYC AML side though, um, this is not a normal specific problem. This is a problem for everything that's programmable. Like everything that's end user programmable has this problem because you can imagine if, um, because you effectively need a whitelisted system if you really want to enforce this. Like if you want to enforce that USDC can only be spent between authorized wallets or wallets that have been whitelisted. You would need to restrict who can interact with the US, with USDC, right? You can't allow USDC to be deposited into arbitrary contracts because any arbitrary contract could wrap this USDC and do another arbitrary computation on top of this. Um, so as a result, if we think that regulators will catch up, that then we're effectively betting that the decentralized space will go away because nothing can, because everything would have to be whitelisted by some sort of regulator to be uh, able to interact with the system. Um, like we can't combine user programmability on Ethereum and USDC is only um, able to be used in whitelisted contract with each other. They're like fundamentally incompatible. Um, we can say USDC can only use in whitelisted things, but that makes USDC pointless because all of a sudden no, nothing will support this. This breaks all of the interoperability uh, aspects that contracts currently have. Um, so I think this is sort of the more general point that regulators are probably not aware of yet, that you can't like put a little bit of um, compliance on top of it. If you have full programmability and interoperability between these systems, uh, you can always escape the regulatory environment. Um, and so I think honestly, probably the better bet is to regulate at the edge point. So like when you go into the traditional fiat banking system, uh, similar to how cash works nowadays, because it's um, doable um, and doesn't break the entire system. I, I'm not sure I I agree with this 100% because basically um, currently if you look at how cash works, I mean cash is regulated if you say pay in cash for something that's worth more than depending on where you are, a thousand euros or 10,000 euros or basically uh, the person who takes the cash or the notary who facilitates uh, the, the transactions, they actually have to um, do KYC and basically you have to um, you don't have to show every single transaction that led to you having the money, but basically you have to make make it plausible that you would come to have, I don't know, a quarter of a million to buy a house, right? Uh, and so basically, this is something that could conceivably be tacked onto this, just like basically, if you have five euros and you go and buy a coffee, obviously, no one's going to do KYC. But if you take uh, half a million and buy a house in cash, then yes, absolutely, you will be subject to KYC. Yeah, th this, that works. I agree. But uh, what I was more referring to sort of uh, 
a blanket KYC on every transaction that's enforced at sort of a smart contract level. Like if you have counterparties with whom you need to interact to buy a house, absolutely. This also works in the this works in the existing system. This will work in the blockchain system because there are two known counterparties to this, um, which I think is also the right model to do. By the way, it's like a very nicely decentralized KYC AML system. <laughs> yeah. Um, so let's talk about. I mean, we've we've talked about a lot of things that you guys envisage. So kind of, can you give us an idea of what's currently live, what will be live soon, and what's gonna what what do you think is going to take however long to build? Because it, it's an enormously complex undertaking, right? What's live now and what will be live soon? So uh, the specification and uh, prototype and testnet for Nomada, um, well, there, there is a testnet. There's not yet a like coordinated testnet, but those are all live on GitHub. You can find the software, you can download it, you can play around with it. Um, there are also prototypes of the intent gossip system and matchmaking system, along with um, uh, architectural spec for Taiga, the private bartering circuit, and an architectural spec for Typhon, which is our consensus algorithm. Um, those I would expect will be, hopefully the private bartering circuit will be ready later this year, along with intent gossip and matchmaking, working with private bartering, which is pretty involved as it has to involve uh, CKP generation during the intent gossip and matchmaking phase. Typhon will probably take uh, take at least another year. But I would also say that like we're trying to come up with a sequence of both technological development and product deployment that makes sense. Even if we launch the full Anoma tomorrow, it probably does too many things uh, for it to be a useful test as a kind of independent hypothesis, which is one reason why we're trying to launch Nomada is a just simpler network that can provide clearer quality of service guarantees around multi-asset shielded transfers and hopefully pretty incentive compatible incentive design for um, giving users a pretty good shielded privacy set. Uh, we're launching that soon and that can at least be um, integrated hopefully with a product stack, including interfaces, which can create zero knowledge proofs and a product stack which solves i mean there are a lot of just really awful ux problems um uh, tornado cache is i think pretty decent now but with uh, a sort of full shielded node blockchain like zcash you still have to scan the whole blockchain to figure out which nodes are yours uh, we can do something slightly better with a, a like a payment request system where you include a special tag on the note so you don't have to scan on your phone all of the new blocks to see if you received payment these UX questions sound kind of trivial, but they sometimes require like changing the architecture of the blockchain or would require hard forking existing systems or changing the circuit. So we're trying to think about that on a whole architecture level so we can make sure the end product is appealing. So Namada should probably August, September, summer around this, October. Um, so around this, like uh, late summer, uh, Namada should go live. I mean, what does this mean? Testnets, the internal testnets have started. We'll probably start rolling out private testnets with a handful of people in the coming weeks. Um, and then probably in six to eight weeks, we'll start having public testnets where anyone can participate, followed by incentivized testnets that eventually lead to a decentralized launch of Namada um, late summer. Um, I, I think at the same time, we are also going to start um, a trusted setup ceremony for Plunkup uh, and our circuits. Um, probably also in the next couple of weeks. So there's going to be announcements around there. Um, I would expect that mainnet or Noma will probably start having testnets after Nomada launch, gearing up for some early 2023 launch. Um, it probably includes Tiger, so private bartering circuits. It probably won't include Typhon. Um, so if the consensus upgrade is probably something that happens post-Anoma post, -launch, post -Anoma mainnet launch. Um, Right. The other thing that comes with an Amada is also bridges. Uh, so we'll probably also launch with an Ethereum bridge. So an IBC adapter for Ethereum, as well as IBC adapters to a bunch of other chains. And I think at that point, the scaling factor will become how can you quickly write IBC adapters for every modern BFT system? Because there's really no reason why like Nia and Polkadot shouldn't communicate to each other via IBC. Um, like the protocol doesn't matter to these people, it's just how you encode data between uh, light client capable blockchains. Um, yeah, I think that's all coming up. 
That sounds like a, a I mean, that's a very impressive um, uh, technical roadmap. What about ecosystem adoption? Do you guys have um, an ecosystem fund to kind of um, foster building on Anoma? Uh, not yet. We haven't yet made the move that every other major blockchain for some reason has made and become, became a VC. Uh, seemed very strange. I didn't expect this to happen in 2017, that every major blockchain would also become a VC at the same time. Um, maybe later this year. We'll see. No, I don't think so. It's the inevitable course of things. Yeah, everything yeah. becomes a VC. Everything is now a fund. Uh, no, but I mean, if people are... Um, the first couple of people that start playing with the code base, um, starting to see how intense work, how intent gossip works, how matchmaking works. Uh, if you're interested, uh, reach out to us. We're, we're very happy to support early prototypes. Um, no formalized structures around being a fund yet, though. <laughs> you know, so, we could do retroactive public goods funding if you make a git commit now. That's that's permanent history. It's like a potential future airdrop target. You never know. Oh, don't don't say that on air. People are going to try to break that. <laughs> I didn't so say I anything. Can, I can, yeah, yeah, okay. <laughs> don't complain about this later. Um, cool. So, when if people want to uh, get in touch with you guys, uh, how how do they best reach out to you? Uh, yeah, you can join on Discord. Um, discord.gg slash Anoma. Um, you can also find more information on the websites, although we're revamping them right now on anoma.net and nomada.net. Um, also on Telegram slash Anoma. Um, Twitter, it's anoma.net, uh, Anoma Network, actually. Um, yeah, and if you just want to reach out, you can also email me, uh, adrian at anoma.network, I think. No, at helix.dev, actually. Adrian at helix.dev. Please don't spam me. Um. <laughs> <laughs> now you're gonna get 50 recruiters to email you about promising blockchain developers that you can mm -hmm. hire and <laughs> yeah all of email is just spam at this point um yeah cool well thanks so much for coming on um guys so yeah i think totally it is like a, a pretty uh daring kind of crazy roadmap no sort of in reinventing like or modifying a lot of different stuff but i'm excited to see you know how it how it plays out i mean at some point we got to like try daring things um just building like another layer of DeFi on top of the previous layer of DeFi to get some new derivatives going at some point gets very old and looks very much like a ponzi scheme uh, i think not enough people do this by the way i think not enough people try to look like fundamentally new things in order to really see where we can take the space. This was like very different sort of like when Cosmos came around, right? Like people tried to still build censorship resistant tech and make proof of stake work. And I think we should go back more to this model where we try to do cool things instead of writing like 300 lines of solidity to do a crypto NFT. Um, but yeah. Also, I would one... I think it's easy to draw the conclusion that blockchain security architectures have worked far too early. Uh, even something like proof of stake, I think the 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 you know jury is still out on whether proof of stake will work long term as a way of securing blockchains, and so that we can hopefully have some architectures which survive the test of time. I think we should really be sweeping the design space. Proof of stake design seems to have you know ended with Cosmos and Near and Polkadot. Um, and I'm not quite sure why, because I don't think it's really been battle tested yet. In another episode, we can talk about cubic slashing. Yeah, there's a lot of things we haven't talked about, and I, I have to, I have to say that um, I was confused when we started this episode, and I'm, I'm, I'm still confused, but maybe on a slightly <laughs> higher level. So I'm, I may, nice. I may go back to read the docs now. <laughs> Great. Higher level confusion. That's a good outcome. <laughs> yeah, I do apologize, boy. When I when we try to explain this, it becomes clear that it's like there are many different spiraling threads in some uh, speculative plan for how they will coalesce, and that plan has yet to materialize in concrete lines of code in all of its aspects. But yeah, I also think this tagline on defining money is like confusing. <laughs> yeah, to me, the the one thing that would have made everything, I think, easier to understand is more diagrams. So I usually go from diagram to diagram and kind of, if I don't get something, I just read the text in the middle. But literally, there there are there are no pictures. You just have to read. It's like uh, very unusual. Forty page vision papers. 
All right, so that's that's a to do for Chris. Add pictures to the papers. True. More diagrams. And <laughs> exactly, yeah. Cool. Thank you guys for coming on. This was a pleasure, and uh, we'll we'll have you back soon uh, to talk about slashing and stuff. Thank you very much for having us. Thank you so much. Cool. Thanks so much.